Good morning, everyone. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for joining us today uh, for a conversation about the vital role of community building and open access initiatives. Um, my name, our speakers today will present four different perspectives about the importance of building new structures for collaboration and communication within the open access book publishing ecosystem. Using the newly launched Path to Open initiative as a case study, we'll share lessons learned in the development of an intentional and transparent community where concerns can be addressed in equitable and thoughtful ways. Uh, my name is Sarah McKee. I'm project manager with um, Amplifying Humanistic Scholarship at the American Council for Learned Societies. And I'm joined today by our panelists who are here facing away from you at the moment, but Kate McCready, who is visiting program officer for Academy Owned Scholarly Publishing at the Big Ten Academic Alliance, Charles Watkinson, the Michigan University Press Director and Associate University Librarian for Publishing, and John Lenahan, Vice President of Published Content at JSTOR, which is part of the not-for-profit Ithaca. So our agenda today, uh, we'll begin our conversation with a brief introduction from John about how the Path to Open initiative works. From there, we'll move into reflections from the panelists based on our varied experiences with open access book models. I should note here that our personal perspectives are informed by our involvement with primarily North American initiatives and what we've learned from them, but we know there's also much to learn from work going on in the, in the European context, including the Coping Project. Um, and finally, we'll share work to date on the development of a community forum for Path to Open. Uh, we know that the transition to open access book publishing inevitably spurs discussions of logistical and financial challenges. Our experiences have shown us that library and publishing communities often struggle independently to find solutions that make open access book publishing viable from their own perspective. Uh, but all too often, a solution that works well for one sector causes unintended complications for another. And then scholars, meanwhile, as the authors and the primary readers of humanistic book publications, are often uncertain about what these changes mean for their disciplines and for their individual careers uh, when the conventional wisdom no longer holds. So we see Path to Open as a three-year pilot and a learning experience that aims to create a new business model for open access publishing through a close alignment with community stakeholders. Um, so with that, I'll turn the, the mic over to John to tell us a little bit about Path to Open. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. So couple quick slides, but just a little to talk about what Path Open is, and as we talk about the community and the importance of that moving forward, we'll get an idea of actually what it's looking to support. And yeah, okay, I'm, I'm trying to see there's this podium to try to go back and forth a little bit. Um, so with Path to Open, first thing is, was looking at, from a library perspective, what are we providing as a solution for a library and when we're looking at providing equity across access, equity across library participation, across user access, and across publisher participation in addition to authors. So first was that we wanted to ensure from a library perspective that there was a solution that provided a cost-effective uh, pricing mechanism for libraries to participate. They're going to be paying for these published books. They pay them at a particular price, and gay store it's about $140 or so US as an average price per book. And looking at, in a scale, with many libraries participating across a larger collection of books, we can look at a much lower cost per book, a better return on investment for libraries. So they see good affordability to support the program. Um, then from a publisher perspective, it's ensuring that there's $5,000 that's provided to publishers for every title that's published in the program in the year that it's published. So there isn't a, a question, there isn't a if funding becomes available. Uh, Ithaca has supported the $5 million of funding that will allow for 1,000 titles to get published at $5 million, regardless of the level of library participation that occurs. So publishers know coming in that there's a guaranteed payment and a guaranteed time period for open access. For authors, it's important that you know what's the readership going to be of the book that I'm publishing. It's important that you know who your audience is going to be. So in this case, currently right now, Path to Open, there's about 120 libraries who are participating in Path to Open. Um, so at this point, library participates, uh, author knows that their book through that publisher is going to be available at a start to 120 participating libraries. When that book becomes open access, there's close to 14,000 institutions on JSTOR, 
Um, we have usage across every country. We'll track that usage data, and I'll talk about that later in the presentation. So there's a really good way for authors to know what the true impact could be of their publication. And then last will be on the readers. Key data, which we won't go through here, but I've talked about on different slides, is like what happens when a book becomes open access in an environment when otherwise it doesn't have the ability to do that. And we look at data in countries in Malaysia and Indonesia and China, Germany, across the board. Same, same books that are sold for licensed content have very little usage, if any at all, across users in these countries. When made open access, immediately upon that time, usage skyrocks where they become part of the top 25 users around the world because access is available to them. So what this model is to kind of help frame it, how it works, it's getting broad level of publisher participation. So currently now we have 38 publishers, um, university presses that are part of this program. The goal is to get to around 50 publishers. We feel like during the pilot will still be a good sustainable way of holding um, a level of equity and participation of publishers and titles in the program. So right now that means there's a range of about five to 15 titles per publisher that's participating. Um, overall, within this first four years, there'll be a thousand books that are published. So uh, that will be 100 that's published this year in 2023 and subsequently 300 titles for each year. So we'll have 1,000 books at the end. Uh, then the, every title that's published in 2023 will become open access at the very beginning of 2026 and it will continue to repeat it that way with the 300 titles in 2024 available in 2027 and so on. So libraries pay a fixed annual fee based on a JSTOR classification towards the pricing um, it's scaled knowing that the anticipation is there'll be many libraries participating, so it's scaled at a low price, that affordability I mentioned early for libraries to come in to participate, but to provide a longer term sustainability that I'll talk about a little later, and that provides that assurance of the open access. Lastly is that we did launch the program, it launched October 1st, so we, were, we met the expectations we had with our publishing partners and with libraries that we would get this launched in October, and we did. Um, 100 titles are available for the title list to know what you participate in. And we have about 155 titles that have already been identified to be published in 2024. And you can see the list from participating publishers in that program. So that's the first part of this. And I'm going to turn it over to get the library perspective from Kate. Thanks, John. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, so. I'm going to talk a little bit from a uh, librarian's perspective. Um, I'm, I'm fundamentally a librarian at the University of Minnesota, and I'm on loan to the Big Ten working on some initiatives. Um, but I look at the, the, these um, new opportunities for creating open access um, content really from that librarian perspective. So as I was thinking about community building in this space, I really thought about how, you know, and especially talking about scholarly monographs, which is um, the framework of, of this um, talk, but the university presses have such a complicated um, financial structure with how they have to make their works um, available in the first place, not even thinking about open access. Um, and I've, in, in this work that I've done at the Big Ten, I've been interviewing university presses uh, and to understand kind of what the challenges are, where there's opportunities for collective action, and I just hear these, these layers of complexity about the work that they do. Um, thinking about how they're, they're having to combine in the scholarly monographs and the trade monographs and, um, and, and hope that something is going to take off in the course material market um, in order to support all the work that they do. It's a very complicated financial structure. So when you add in, and, and getting subsidies is another thing that they're constantly trying to do, right? So adding in the layer of open access is really, really challenging, and it makes it, I feel like university presses are always hustling uh, to try and make this work. And these works are also just very expensive to produce. So how um, libraries then are thinking about um, purchasing these expensive works, their budgets have shrunk for these monographs and for humanities publishing. Um, I was just talking to the University of Minnesota collections folks and their budget um, to just traditionally in the last five, 10 years, it had been 15% for firm orders for approvals for books. Um, and that's shrunk to about 10% now. 
um, because it's just being compressed for those recurring resources, the inflation rate is so high. So open access, though, is really seen as a way for libraries to make investments in um, monograph publishing, in oh, um, making that available, that content more widely available and stretching their budgets. And so they really want to see um, this happen. But I think university presses feel like it's an additional burden. So there's this natural, um, this natural tension that exists uh, between this library and press relationship. I think, fo so focusing on that business relationship is something that we've really been trying to work on and think about um, in the, the area of what I'm working on and I think what they're doing in Path to Open. Um, because in the past, you know, libraries were really looking for the best price. They were looking for the most content for the least amount of money. Um, and it was an adversarial relationship, I would say, between the presses and the libraries. Uh, that libraries were kind of seen by the presses as just another customer um, and really negotiating on those finances. So in these new spaces of creating open access content, I think we've had to make a big shift, um, especially in libraries where we say this is not just another publisher that we're working with. We actually have, we come from the same institutions. Uh, we have to collaborate if we want to make open access. Um, viable and, and uh, feasible because it is such another barrier to creating that content. And we do have a lot of shared goals. You know, at the fundamental mission, I think if you compare, when we have looked, if you compare a library's mission statement to a university press mission <coughs> statement, they're very similar about providing access to knowledge, creating opportunities for knowledge to be used. Um, and I think if we really kind of go back to that, it's very helpful in saying we can work together to um, find some mutually beneficial uh, opportunities and to collaborate. Things like collaborating on messaging to university administrators, um, working together across presses, across libraries, uh, and, and working to, um, to advocate for what it is that we're trying to accomplish. Um, and I went too far there. So moving to a values framework, um, that's where I really think that um, we focus in on that broad access to um, materials that scholars want. So we're all working with those scholars and those individual uh, researchers. And they want, when they're, when they're writing something, they want it to get out there and to make an impact on the world. Um, and that's what libraries want. We want to make that available. Presses want that when they're making the content into a publication. So how can we work together and really rethink the, the purchasing relationship to more of an investment relationship? And what do we want to invest in jointly together in order to create? Um, and I've, I've, seen, I've seen that shift in thinking happening, and I see sparks of it happening in different meetings, like the Subscribe to Open pre-conference. There were, there were quite a few people who were saying, but oh, yeah, if I shift and I really say, I'm going to support my values, I think it's a different um, it's a different mentality and it's a helpful one for thinking where we really want these dollars to go and where we want our efforts to go and to think about what extends access not necessarily what provides access to just our own communities so big 10 open books is another um, partnership that um, I've been I've been working on along with Charles uh, who will talk next um, and this is where we've gotten six university presses to collaborate together to create open access content. Um, we formed a committee of librarians and university press uh, folks with specific expertise around copyright and around business models, around access. Um, and we thought through this together to create 100 books on the topic of gender and sexuality studies to make them open access. They were previously published. We converted them into accessible formats. We single-handedly sent that um, metadata off to discovery platforms so that libraries could adopt that content. And that saved each press from having to figure out how to do that on their own. And the libraries were very, very excited to support it financially because they had a hand in building um, what that model looked like. So I'm going to turn it over to Charles at this point to uh, carry on the discussion. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, so, the uh, it's 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 unbelievably frustrating um, uh, 
to be in the university press space. Um, because um, there are 100 university presses in the US. Um, half of them are very, very small. They are absolutely keystone species in their academic communities and in their regions. And if you go to an academic conference uh, in almost any subject area, almost all the booths are university press booths, and they are busy because they are working with scholars on process and creating things that look like widgets, but in fact, behind the scenes are incredibly different from things that are more widget-like produced. And that's very costly and it's expensive, and that's where the university press, acquisitions editors, and most of the directors who come from the acquisitions background are focused. They're focused on the scholars, they're focused on the authors. And then what happens is they fail to collaborate, we fail to collaborate and work together on the outward facing parts of our work. And what has happened traditionally with all of that is that um, because we don't pay attention to that, we go for the easiest option, which is usually a commercial aggregator or a commercial partner, and then the libraries just see university presses being represented by somebody who wants to sell that content as content. Not as process, not as uh, academy owned, but just as content. And this really is the background to this thinking about community building and community in general, that what's rather unique about Path to Open is it's a product of trying to think together as an academy-owned entity and group of entities in a different way. And you'll notice that all the components of what we're talking about are all based in institutions or in non-profits. And that is very, very deliberate. Um, so that's just the reflection of the broader picture of community. And I just wanted to reflect on the problems that we navigate when we um, deal with community thinking versus the need for scale, versus the need for efficiency and agility. Um, and I've been involved with a couple of very contrasting um, programs which view community in different ways. And it really is in our collaboration around Path to Open, which has a year of conversations behind it involving colleagues like John Lavender, who's here, and Sharla Lair at Lyricist, who's not here, and my colleague, significantly John Shearer at UNC Press, who couldn't be here, as well as, um, as, well as John and the JSTOR folk and Sarah. Um, what, we, um, what we've been talking about is like, how can we leverage scale, the only scale we have as academy-owned infrastructure providers with a partner like JSTOR, which is the biggest gorilla in our non-profit academy-owned space, how can we do that while still maintaining the authenticity of being a community-driven project, not driven by a vendor? And I will pay all tribute to JSTOR because JSTOR has been able to take a step back and to actually allow some control to be taken away, which is hard to do if you have a history of trying to be a, uh, you know, a, an efficient commercial organization. Anyhow, Lever Press and UM Press Fund Mission. Level Press was an experiment starting around 2016 to really run a, a, a library director-driven press. So it has, it spent a lot of time creating a very complicated governance structure right at the start. The consequence was we were very, very slow to produce books. Since then, we have um, twisted things a little bit and we've iterated on the community concept. Level Press is now owned by a separate initiative, a 501c3 owned by the liberal arts colleges, but it's almost entirely operated by one publisher. And Michigan <coughs> Publishing, where, which uh, is part of the University of Michigan Library um, and is the parent organization of University of Michigan Press, employs all the staff, one and a half staff, signs all the contracts, <laughs> um, uses and builds our platform in co-development with, um, with the liberal arts college libraries, provides production services and distribution. There's still an oversight committee, and there's an editorial board of faculty, but those roles are very clearly delimited from the operational functioning, and suddenly the books are flowing, and it's really starting to make a difference. So that is a story of moving from very, very heavy community committee kind of work to something a little bit more streamlined while not losing that authentic connection to community. 
University of Michigan Press is much more like a traditional publisher with an advisory board. Um, what we have worked on here is a slightly different kind of community building, which is what Kate has described, which is how do we build um, a university press and library relationship, which is much more about we're all in it for the same reasons, with the same values, and we're all in the service of the academic community. And that's been a, a project of a decade or more, and it's still a project in, um, in motion. So it's just so complicated to get these different parties, different cultures in the same, facing in the same direction. But it's finally starting to gain traction. And a third of the university presses um, uh, in the country report now to um, libraries that that work of integration, working together and finding common ground and finding common values is really only just starting to happen. So with that, I'm going to pass over to um, a funder author perspective, Sarah. Thanks, Charles. Um, so yes, I'll be uh, representing the funder author perspective and focusing on um, an initiative that I worked on more in my previous position at Emory University, which was the TOME initiative, um, which stands for Toward an Open Monograph Ecosystem. And for those of you who may not be super familiar with that, um, TOME was a pilot funding model for open access books that ran from 2017 to 2022. Uh, and the, the site for that is still live at openmonographs.org, so you can see there the books that were published, um, open access under that initiative, and all the different um, institutions that participated in it. Um, the core collaborators were three stakeholders, so the Association of Research Libraries, the Association of University Presses, and the Association of American Universities. Um, and the final report um, on that pilot was published just this past August. Uh, the URL for that is, is there as well. Um, that goes into, into great detail, but I'm going to hit just a few highlights of things that we consider to be successes of the pilot, but then also some lessons that we learned uh, that we hope to bring with us into the development of, of the new Path to Open um, um, structure. So the success of the pilot was that we did uh, published more than 160 open access books over the course of, of, of those five years, and they were funded by 20 institutions. So it functioned as a book processing subvention um, model. Um, so at Emory University, for example, um, you know, we found funding within Emory University um, to support uh, making open, I think, 16 or 17 um, books from our own faculty. And that was how it worked. So Emory was one of those 20 institutions. Each of those institutions supported, provided subventions to support books uh, published by their own faculty. Uh, we have participation from 27 university presses, some of whom were publishing open access for the very first time. Um, others who were old, older hands at it and had the infrastructure in place, so it was an opportunity for some new publishers to enter that space. Um, overall, it was a very positive experience for the authors. I think having that um, you know, strong level of support from both their home institutions as well as their publishers made it a much lighter lift for them so they didn't have to figure out all the logistics and could really just focus on the benefits of having their book published open. And they were, they were you know, unilaterally very happy with that. Um, and then, of course, one of the most important things that we were trying to do in this community was to put libraries and presses in conversation with the scholarly communities um, and try to figure out a way forward. So lessons learned, um, Tome by design really allowed for and encouraged a diversity of funder requirements and OA publishing practices. So this meant that all 20 of those institutions um, could require different things from, from the publishers. And the publishers were also you know, subject to the requirements of the funders, really able to move forward with publishing open access books in whatever way worked best for them, for the relationships with vendors they already had in place, to figure all of that out. Um, and we really saw that as necessary flexibility for experimentation to do things in a bunch of different ways and to see what we could learn from it. But um, I think that has also raised some really important questions. Um, you know, 
First and most importantly, how do we make the funding for OA monographs more equitable? Um, clearly, the BPC model is not the most equitable way to go, or a, an equitable way to go. Um, you know, authors from only 20 institutions could participate. And on the flip side, even though we had 27 university presses participating, we had nearly twice as many who wanted to participate and just didn't have the right author at the right time during the pilot. Um, and so from there also, you know, what are best practices for robust accessibility, thinking beyond just taking down the paywall, what do we need to be doing to make the books accessible in a digital environment? Um, the publisher practices vary pretty wide, widely on that. Um, what are the best ways to distribute the OA monographs? Um, again, and that was very dependent on publisher relationships with different vendors. So we had books in all kinds of different places, which was great. Um, but then for the next point, that really made it difficult to gather metrics. So getting good metrics for the tone books was a real challenge, um, you know, gathering from all of these different places. Um, and so then, what is the sustainable structure for the program beyond the pilot? Um, I don't think we answered that question, unfortunately. So, um, you know, the conversations are still going on, but, you know, what tone looks like going forward is still a bit unclear. So I think, you know, thinking at the beginning of the model about what the structure might look like at the end is exceptionally important. Um, so we have an opportunity now to learn from all this individualized experimentation and to develop practices in community um, and with a focus on the shared values and needs that all these different community members bring to the table. Um, and that's a big part of what we're trying to do here with Path to Open. And so with that, I'll turn it over to John. Thanks. I'm going to work to get us back on track. I'm going to go through quick because I just looked at the time. We have like yeah. 13 minutes or 12 minutes. Yeah. So, um, so I'll go here pretty quick. I think that the first thing that was important um, was Path to Open also became and developed as a name um, that was created in the community as a starting point. So we went out and actually took examples and put out to the community, to the libraries, and to the publishers what, with a framework of what this looks like, what should a name and what should a process be to develop what Path to Open was. And I think from, from the perspective that I have is it can't be, it's a JSTOR, JSTOR's path to open product that just never felt right. And it didn't feel right from the beginning of it, and it didn't feel right as we moved forward. So it really started to go, how does this become not a JSTOR path to open, but path to open is actually a way that books go from being licensed as they're published to a pathway to becoming open and it's owned and managed through the community. JSTOR provides an infrastructure service. It provides a low cost option to be able to get the content out there to the places where readers are. And that becomes our role. It's a defined role, not as a business owner of it. And I think that comes to trust. And I'll leave it at that with the comments there as a starting point. Um, then it has to come through this area here. This is about like listening, simple as that. But without listening, you don't hear what the problems are. Like Emily and Kate, we, we were talking this morning there are particular challenges of models that publishers have consistently. You need to document and listen to those. And are you providing a solution for that? Or are you ignoring it? So that part of that community is really truly listening and documenting and ensuring that you've got data that can support what the proposed solution is, which is what we were providing in our working group that we talked about earlier. Then in here is collaboration. This isn't about all discovery starts at JSTOR, and that's all we think about. JSTOR is going to be a percentage of discovery of the content, but delivering metadata to discovery service providers, working with BiblioVault and CoreSource to make sure that publishers have an easy way to be able to distribute into the sources that get published over in JSTOR, working with partners like in ProQuest and EBSCO that manage Gobi and Oasis, Rialto, like how is Path to Open managed through there? How does that impact and change print? If it says it's open in the future, does that mean print stops, which is the case if it's not well informed in some of these workflow systems? So how is that done? How are we collaborating? How do we work with spaces in DOAB and OAPEN? How working in new initiatives like OA Switchboard or the uh, Open Access eBook Usage Data Trust that we make sure data and information goes in so it's widely distributed across a broad community. And lastly, it's about transparency and evidence. It's, and it's that simple. What are the success metrics? Everyone should know here, and we're report out on it. What do we expect this program to do? And you should all, everyone that's part of the community, go, is it, is it doing that? Who's participating in it? 
What's the revenue associated to it? What are the costs that manage it? Where's their surplus? Does the surplus go back in to publish new books? What does that mean for the long term of the program? And that's about transparency of data. So this is all about usage, participation, revenue, cost, and that needs to go out consistently. Uh, so the community can be making informed decisions about if long-term sustainability is what's important for this program, we sure as heck need to make sure that we're measuring it the right way. And if not, we use the community group to provide guidance to put us in the right space. So I'll end with that. Hopefully I got through that pretty quick yeah. and I can pass back over to Sarah. Thanks, John. Yeah. <laughs> Bring it at home now. Um, so I'm very happy to say that in my new role, um, my current role at ACLS, um, we we really got involved with Path to Open to help with this community aspect. And so again, we really see the whole program as an opportunity to learn how to create a sustainable and equitable model that changes OA Monograph publishing across the whole community and not just for individual presses and libraries. Um, and so to that end, ACLS has been working with the Educopia Institute um, to develop a community advisory group uh, that will launch um, in full in early 2024. And this group, as John mentioned, will work closely with JSTOR to offer supporting guidance on developing transparent policies during the pilot, and importantly, as I noted earlier, to create a sustainable structure for the program beyond the pilot. Uh, so our timeline for this, over summer and fall, we conducted a series of focus groups with key constituencies, um, including libraries, publishers, scholars, um, and representatives from other mission-aligned OA initiatives. Um, and then, um, starting on Monday, we're having our first interim community group meeting, uh, which pulls from some of the participants in those various focus groups. Um, and the interim community group, it's a very iterative, careful, thoughtful process working with Educopia. It's been an absolute delight to work with them. Um, it will focus on defining the roles and responsibilities of the community group vis-a-vis JSTOR um, and creating a structure for what that ongoing community group will look like over the course of the three-year pilot. Um, and then starting in spring 24, that community group will be operational. Uh, we're expecting there may be some working groups within it, um, but that structure will be announced um, shortly in the new year. Um, and so again, you know, our, our goal here is to bring together a mixed group of stakeholders from all of these different communities to work closely with JSTOR um, on all of the values um, that we've, I think, iterated over the course of this presentation so far. So to stay in touch, sign up for our community newsletter at the ACLS uh, website, and I think there will be ways for, for folks to get involved, um, even beyond the community advisory group, but our goal is to, to really maintain good, open, transparent communication. So with that, we will open it up to questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>